Charles McLeod is the author of the, of the novel American Weather and National Treasures, a collection of short stories. He's a recipient of a Pushcart Prize and fellowships from the University of Virginia, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, and San Jose State University, where he was a Steinbeck Fellow. His new collection, Settlers of Unassigned Lands, was recently published by University of Michigan Press. One critic called it innovative, prescient, and cruel. The stories feature a range of characters, a porn star trying to transition to mainstream, a heroin dealer in an Oakland graveyard, a conductor of food company focus groups, to name just a few. His stories examine the dark complexities of American life. Atticus Lish worked a series of blue-collar jobs, served briefly as a Marine, moved to China with his wife, and no doubt various other things, before he surfaced this year with one of the most exciting and widely praised books of recent memory. Preparation for the Next Life tells the story of the unlikely love affair of a just back from the war soldier and a Uyghur woman from western China working illegally in the U.S. In his New York Times uh, review, Dwight Garner said, at its naughty core, amazingly, is perhaps the finest and most unsentimental love story of the new decade. It's one that builds slowly in intensity like a shaft of sunlight into an anthracite mine. Wow. Among other citations, preparation for the next life was recently shortlisted for the Penn Faulkner Award. And although, although the prize hasn't been awarded yet, it's been announced as the winner of the Carla Cohen Literary Prize for Fiction. They'll be presented on May 16th, so he'll be back for that. So thanks for coming and help me welcome these two great authors. And Charles will read first. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. And um, many thanks to Politics and Prose for having me. And um, it is a real honor to read with Atticus. Um, uh, his novel is absolutely amazing. Uh, I think that when America looks back and asks um, sort of, you know, what, okay, um, what, what happened uh, after we imparted the Im immigration policy that we did and what happened after we treated soldiers back from Afghanistan and Iraq um, in the way that we did, it's going to be a text that is turned to. Um, and uh, it's, if, if you haven't read it, read it. Um, so I'm, I'm going to read a slightly um, abbreviated version of um, the second story in the new collection called Exit Wounds. I'm from Oakland, California, and uh, a lot of what I write takes place in the Bay Area. Um, I suppose that uh, most of the stories in the collection, um, as the title might indicate, are, are dealing with people who find themselves in new places or find familiar places changed in some way. Uh, so so this, this story takes place in San Francisco, and if anyone's, I don't know, from the San Francisco Bay Area, it's certainly changed a lot over the course of my life. Uh, so I wanted to set a story there with someone that feels out of place, I guess. Um, uh, okay, exit wins. <clears throat> I was renting the attic room of an illegal boarding house, a condemned Victorian run by a mistress of the chief of police, but there had been an argument of some sort between these two parties, and the place had been raided, and boards had been nailed up over all the windows and doors. I tried to find my car, but I couldn't find it. So I went down to the Mission and 16th BART station to look for my friend Terry, who sold fake drugs there sometimes. Sure enough, there he was. I knew you'd be here, I said. Where else do I have to go, Terry answered. He was crouched down, cutting up a bar of soap with a penknife. The curled peels were landing on a page of newspaper he'd spread out over the ground. The hood of Terry's sweatshirt was ripped off on one side, and it made it look like he had a short, broken cape attached to himself. School children were playing in the afternoon shadows, finding ways to wreck their Catholic plaids. Can't they just leave us alone? I was pointing. The air smelled of water and garbage. People ascended the subway's escalator, pretending we weren't even there. You could make yourself useful for once, Terry told me. Why don't you start filling up these balloons? From his palm, he shook out five or six of the little rubber things, but I didn't feel like working. What are we going to call them when we're done, I asked. They're one-in-ones, cocaine and heroin, all mashed up. But they're soap. Now you've got the music going. Do you happen to have any real drugs, I asked. I will after I've sold these, Terry said. <laughs> in the upstairs of a thrift store, I kept putting items in my pockets. I wanted everything, now that I had nowhere for any of it to go. One of those guardian angels in their tilted hats got right up next to me and crossed his arms, but I just stood there, staring at the metal shelves of goblets and ceramic junk. 
I saw what you were doing, the angel said. It all looks so lonely, I told him. I'm only trying to help. That morning, the group of we evicted had stood on the tall sidewalk of Texas Avenue, waiting for the cuffs to snap on. There were 10 of us in total, or 15, and certainly we'd never been gathered like this before, blinking in the sun and horribly aware of one another, figuring out who had cigarettes and who did not. The policemen had brought hammers. They were ripping the shutters off the front of the house and turning them sideways over the windows. The mistress was wailing and being led down the steps. My truths, my, liber my liberties, my livelihood, she pleaded. Mascara had stained her fake silk dress. <coughs> Some in our group were prying at her fingers. I'd thought we were trying to save her, but we were really only after her rings. When the policemen drew their batons, we scattered, spreading like pollen over the city. Mission Avenue was miles long, and I'd been over every inch of it, from the Greyhound Station at the foot of the bridge out to Silver Avenue, where most of the shop signs were in Spanish. But I could never remember what stood where, the specific order of things, so I walked the blocks again and again, checking and rechecking, hoping some wide, precious idea might strike me because I could feel myself getting older, <laughs> the ports closing, the ships pulling up all their ropes. Past the doorframe of the Audrey, I saw Parnell on a stool. He was nursing a port and shirtless, his brown skin shining in the sun. On weekends for work, Parnell painted over the track marks on his neck with makeup and did ventriloquism at children's parties. His stage name, I think, was Sultan the Wondrous. His dummy's name was Parnell. The Audrey itself was a long, narrow bar. Until the 80s, it had shared a wall with a garment factory, but that place had caught fire and its insides had melted, and it would never be rebuilt again. Above the Audrey's booth, she could see where the plaster had bubbled and pocked from the heat, the flames wanting more and more. It was an easy place to feel brave in, and this, of course, was what we were after, to be the survivors of some tragedy that could never have possibly affected us, to live on and on telling lies to strangers about having seen the ashes and tasted the soot. <coughs> Parnell, the real one, lent money on occasion. I was terrified of him, which he admired me for. In this way, the two of us had built a relationship based around debt. Your car got towed and I'm completely broke, he told me. It was Jenkins that did it, so you know. Are you sure you don't have any money, I asked him. The Audrey was empty except for the two of us. Parnell just sat there and shrugged. I'm drinking on vouchers the bartender made me. You can ask him yourself when he gets back. Where did he go in the first place? His dog's dying. He took it to the vet. How did the bartender make you those vouchers? No one would believe that. Not a species on earth. My pockets are empty, Parnell said. There aren't parties for months. Over his back were tattoos that spelled out lines from the scripture. I could make out the shells and the halves and the wants. From the stool next to him, Parnell lifted up his puppet. Its legs swung on their twined pulleys. The wood face looked just like Parnell's own. I could do a show for you, he said, brightening. I could practice my routine. Parnell stuck his arm into the guts of the dummy. The Audrey's television was on, but the sound was off. Around a lawn diamond in a different time zone, athletes stood waiting, and here I was thinking of them when they would never, ever think of me. Past the bar's door, a bus gasped, accelerating toward somewhere else. For a moment, it blocked out the sun entirely, and I could see for the first time Parnell's eyes. He was flung on dope, just gone. You could have saved me some of what you've taken, I told him. That was a pretty selfish thing to do. Help, this man has his hands in me, said the puppet. Help, 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 help. Would you tell if I took a beer from the cooler? Could I get behind there and back out? I don't know, said Parnell. The dog, it was shaking so badly. It was a big thing, a lab or a hound. The people around here, they're just exit wounds. They're just proof that something went wrong. I leaned over the bar's counter, sliding back the cooler's door. Inside were ice and endless varieties. The column bottles were sweating as though it were work just waiting there. There were so many kinds I couldn't make a decision. I started taking all of them out, using my lighter to pry off their tops. The puppet mumbled something about wisdom and courage. What did he say, I asked, finishing one bottle and picking up another. Nothing, Parnell said, handing me a voucher. 
don't worry about it at all. At the top of Bernal Park, 100 yards above the lanes of grids and streets, a big man who claimed he was a banker asked me for a date. His cowboy boots had silver over their tips, and on his right wrist he wore a lady's tennis bracelet, a gold thing with a heart-shaped charm that swung and dangled when he motioned. The steep walk had forced me to almost to vomit, but I'd held down my insides and kept my high, and now San Francisco was all around me, the lines of houses like rows of teeth. I could see both bridges, the Oakland Hills on the other side of the flat blue bay. The Mission District was broke again. All the people who had made a living from computers had lost their jobs and moved away, and the filthy sidewalks belonged once more to us, the addicts and immigrants, the departed and the just arrived, who were left to hope and rob and wait for the country's next set of good times to roll around, at which point we would again be pushed from sight. It wasn't so bad, either, except for the fact that there were those who told us we were doing something wrong when we were only doing what they expected. From the breast pocket of his gray lined suit, the banker brought out a bill. I wasn't nervous. I couldn't feel my face at all. I've never done this before, I told him. You're going to do it now, though, he said. There were white bits of saliva at the corners of his mouth, and he was chewing on a sandwich, the plastic wrap greased and hanging. You're from the Midwest, aren't you, I said. He had the accent and that look to him, too, like he'd been run through with dumb joy. I'd seen it that morning when I looked in the mirror. I couldn't escape it, though I tried and tried. The banker put his hands on my shoulders, pushing downward. My wife was from Bismarck. Your hair is like, hers wa is like hers was. I'm always so hungry. I can't seem to fill up. I was fumbling with the lever of his belt when a public works truck came up the park's winding road, startling the man and sending him away. His money was still in my pocket, though, and I saw him the very next week at the Audrey or at a bar just like it. They were all over the mission, and as I've told you, I could never keep them quite straight. He was sitting at a brown vinyl booth with a cross-dresser named Michael, truly the most abused creature I'd ever seen. You couldn't tell where the bruises stopped under his slip, but here he was laughing and happy, poking with his straw at his drink. The banker had his arms spread over the booth's top, his wrist charm catching light from the wall lamps. For hours, off and on, he gave me the kind of stare a child throws Christmas mornings when he's torn the wrappings from every present and stands waiting for a gift that will never arrive. On I-64, west of Evansville, I walked the shoulder, not bothering to look back. For three days, I'd come south from Ohio, sleeping hidden in the daylight hours and hitching scared down the blacktop at night. At rest stops, I broke into cars and I took things. Behind shade trees or dumpsters, I waited hours at a time. That night, a semi-tip not 50 yards in front of me. It was on the fast side of the two lane and the median held no rail, just a sunken maw of tan grass that dipped quickly and efficiently. The semi swerved and caught the edge and lifted itself sideways, crashing. Bumpers and axles dug at the earth. There was a great metallic wailing. Overhead, the stars shone, indifferent. It was four in the morning. No cars had passed for close to an hour. I thought about the driver, sleeping forever inside. The semi's trailer door had opened on impact, and amongst the smoke and dust, there in the nighttime lifted hundreds or thousands of bees. They moved, then stood, confused or learning their way from that confusion, but for a short time they were only small things that held moonlight. They were alive, and I was alive, and we were living. When the buzzing rose up and reached me, I was saddened. They'd named themselves, and we now had to act accordingly. All around us were cornfields and farther off farmhouses, their porch lights like code on the flatland. The insects pushed on and I kept walking west. The sky was so wide it was startling. Thanks. Everybody. Thanks for coming out, and uh, thanks to Charles just now. That was great. Um, I was just sitting there thinking, not a word out of place. That's, that was a clinic. That was really awesome. 
Um, uh, thank you also to Politics and Pros, and uh, just a real honor to be here. Um, I, so my book is called Preparation for the Next Life, and what it's about is a uh, Chinese Muslim who uh, immigrates illegally to the United States where she meets an Iraq war vet. And what I'll read to you now is the scene where they meet. One day, three or four days after arriving in the city, having just taken his meds, he went back down into the subway and sat down on the first train that came and didn't move until after it had risen up out of the tunnel into daylight onto elevated tracks, passing the backs of billboards, train yards, and water towers. After a couple stops, he went up to the window and stuck his face against it and watched the rooftops coming. The stops kept coming. He had gotten a long way out. Across the field of rooftops, he saw cranes. Down below, he saw a car turning on the littered street and heard a burst of the hammer drill from an auto repair. In theory, it might have been possible to figure out where he was from the map and how he could get back. Instead, he said to himself, no, let me go all the way to the end. When they got to the last stop, he got off because he had to and went out on the street. It was crowded and a woman bumped him with her shopping bags coming out of Caldor. He raised his hooded head and looked at her and she apologized. Along the curb, he noticed people sitting in the Asian squat, selling wallets, belts, New York hats, backpacks, and DVDs. It was very loud with people yelling. A truck was idling, blocking the intersection, the engine spinning, and he could hear the diesel exploding in the shaking block of steel. Someone honked and Skinner twitched. He lit a cigarette and watched pigs being offloaded onto the shoulders of Mexicans. They were carrying the heavy, cold, white carcasses through the crowd and in through the hanging plastic strips in the back of a Chinese market. <laughs> Vertical Chinese signs were everywhere. Someone tried to give him a flyer, and he said, I don't understand you, and dropped it. He went into a newsstand and got a Red Bull. In the back of the store, he stopped and stared at the magazines. All the metal slots were filled with porn. He saw a tan girl with her wet hair plastered to her face and her mascara streaked. He kept getting pushed and it bothered him. He forced his way out through the people coming into the newsstand and once outside, drank his Red Bull moving with the crowd. Another four foot woman handed him a flyer. Massagi, she said. The piece of paper said body work, one hour. Awesome, he said, and stuffed it in his pocket. The garbage on the street had a peculiar smell. In the windows, he saw red roast pork on steel hooks. A mother was squatting, helping a boy urinate in the gutter. When he flipped his empty can into the garbage, an immigrant in flowered sleeve guards came behind him and picked it up with tongs. He heard a chanting, which was all their voices overlapping. The women wore black leather jackets and spike-heeled boots with buckles and fringe. One of them looked at him directly, and she had eyeliner and a mane of dyed reddish hair, and then he lost her in the crowd. He went down the avenue, crossing under a railroad bridge, and searched down an alley, passing right by a doorway where each tread of the stairs said table shower, leading up to a massage parlor on the second floor. At night, the stairs would have been lit up like a runway, and he would have guessed what it was then, but in the daytime, you had to read Chinese to know what you were seeing. He came to the projects behind the train tracks. From here, he saw the bridge and the water, and he went back down another alley until he was on the avenue with the crowd again. He took the flyer out of his pocket and checked it. The crowd was taking him like a conveyor belt past everywhere he had already been. After he had gone beneath the railroad bridge a second time, he saw a group of men hanging around in front of what looked like a condemned building, smoking cigarettes. There was a dead gray neon sign on an upper floor that spelled KTV. Skinner tried to see inside through the thick, smeared glass doors. The men eyed him. What's the foreigner doing? Look at this clothing of his. A cop? A health inspector? A person with time on his hands? Pay no attention to him. Skinner pulled the door open and went inside. The building was occupied and there were utilities functioning inside it. He could feel them right away. 
a back door was open and a young male, by the sound of his voice, was in the alley talking on the phone in a rough, loud Asian language. Stairs led up and down. When Skinner began checking the first floor, he discovered a maze filled with 99-cent store-type goods. Backpacks and umbrellas hung from the ceiling. The vendors, eating noodles out of styrofoam bowls and talking loudly, went silent as he moved down the aisle. When he looked back, he realized they were watching him on closed-circuit TV. What's down here? They ignored him to his face. He saw them exchanging looks, and a woman stared at him as if he were a monster. A man in a gold chain circled behind him, pretending not to look at him. When Skinner repeated his question, a thick-faced woman of about 40 who was knitting shook her head. Then she turned to the others and said, Impotent. No speaky English, huh? Good to go. He stuck his large, broken-nailed hand in a cardboard shipping box, took out a padded bra, and chucked it back. Clumping upstairs in his boots, he found nothing but a locked door on the second-story landing and a table covered in takeout condiment packets and other trash. He jogged back down to the first floor and stuck his head out in the alley, catching a whiff of garbage, seeing fire escapes and hearing exhaust fans. Whoever had been on the phone out here had gone. He went back inside and checked down the stairs, this time descending to the basement. In the basement, there were food stands packed in together. Fires were hissing, and it was loud. Napkins were soaking on the floor. The linoleum was rotting down to the wood beneath. He went around the rusting folded tables where Asians sat in jeans with keys on their belts, looking fixedly at their phones. What you want, a woman yelled. Where's the massage at? Where the who? Where's the massage spot at? The girls. No, no girl, she yelled. Noodle. Skinner tried to see inside her metal pot. Well, what kind of noodles is it? She pointed with the ladle at the sign overhead. Up there, she told him. The sign said, field poultry with family flavor northern hot, 275. <laughs> he kept walking through the maze of tables and pillars holding up the bowing ceiling and the gas hissing and the yelling and the banging of walks. When there was nowhere else to go, he returned to a steel fire door with a half-lit exit sign askew above it, which he had noticed earlier, and checked it again. The alarm contacts were painted over. There was no handle on this side, but he could see the latch was not engaged. After glancing briefly over his shoulder, he wedged his fingers in the gap and pulled it open. Nothing went off. He held the door open and leaned inside, seeing a cinder block hallway. The ceiling was half ripped down and there were acoustic tiles buckled, rotted, water stained and lying broken on the floor. He stepped inside. The fire door <laughs> banged shut behind him. For a moment he stood there listening. The air was cold. A sheet of plastic hung over a window in the cinder block wall and it puffed in when the air pressure changed. Through the plastic sheet he could hear the street. Something was humming, barely at the level of hearing, and his head turned towards the sound. He took a step, concrete shards popping under the heel of his boot. The humming was electricity, he thought. He moved down the hallway, past standpipes rising through the floor, the humming growing distinct. He went through a doorless doorway and began to see fluorescent light. Then the hallway angled, and when he turned the corner, he saw someone. She was sitting on the fire stairs in tight, threadbare jeans. She had worked discolored hands, and her dark hair was in a ponytail, and he could see her thighs curved down to where she sat. A muscle ran up the side of her neck from her collar to her jaw. The brim of her hat tilted up, and she looked at him. Hey, he said. She watched him coming towards her. I'm cool. I just took a wrong turn. You get lost, she said. He came a little closer. Yeah, I got lost. She had not taken her eyes off him. At first, she had thought he was a cop. Now she was examining his camouflage. You are army? He glanced at himself. Yeah, I just got out. I was down south until a couple days ago. I just got here. It's my first time in New York. She listened to this and put a lock of hair behind her ear. You live here? I live, she asked. Yeah, you. Do you live? He pointed at the ground here. New York? Yes, I live New York. You like it? Yes, good. It's supposed to be a good place to party. Party? 
you know, like beers, jamming out to music, whatever, just partying. He sang, da, 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 and did a little goof off dance. I like, she smiled. This is very good. Their eyes met and they looked away. He took his cigarettes out. You smoke? No. Good girl, huh? I am runner. Runner? Like running? Yes, runner. Why'd you want to know if I was in the army, Skinner asked. Why? Why, I ask? Yeah, why? Because in my family, we are the army. You were in the army? What army? Not I am. My father, in the People's Liberation of China. My father is the sergeant. No way. Is that why you're strong? You look strong. Strong? Yes. She stood up and stepped forward into a deep lunge. Every day, I am doing running, gymnastic, like this one. And she dipped up and down, touching her knee to the floor. Skinner watched her legs flexing. I do many of them. And Yang Wu Tui. What? Yang Wu Tui, she said. Pushing, like this one. And she mimed doing push-ups. Most girls can't do them. Yes, I can do. I don't know. I have to see this. I show you. She got down, brushed concrete shards away from her hands, and hooked one foot behind her ankle. Skinner gazed at her cell phone outlined in the back pocket of her jeans. She did a perfect push-up. Then she took a breath and did a series of them. Wow, he said. She got up smiling, dusting off her hands. Ten, she said. That was awesome. Please, she said, stepping back with a sweeping gesture, offering him the floor. Who, me? Yes, you are. Push, please. <laughs> How many you want, he asked, pulling off his camouflage. Oh, 100. <laughs> In China Army, boys can do 100. If you will be better than them, maybe I think 120. Is that all? He got down and started pushing. She watched the nape of his erect, short-cropped head, the ridged plates of his shoulders going together and apart, his kinetic energy as he threw his body up and down. He counted off in a rapid, mild voice. Her eyes went from the star on his neck down to the fulcrum of his boots. In the center of his spine, his shirt was getting damp. He paused with his tattooed arms locked out and his triceps twitching, sucked air, and kept going. His neck turned red. He kept his voice even as he counted off the hard ones. Finally, he grunted and his back bent, and he came up slowly. 50 okay? You are good. She gave him the thumbs up. I don't know. Used to be. Yes, yeah, strong, very strong, she said. It's nothing great. She felt his arm. He flexed for her, and she gripped his muscle. You have Chinese word? He pulled his sleeve up and showed her. It says, no pain, no gain. Can you read it? Is that what it says? Something's like this, she said. Want to try this, he asked, pointing at his chest. Soberly, she felt his chest. How about you? You show me? Yes. She flexed her bicep for him. They both looked at her bicep as he felt it through her long underwear shirt. What about the leg? Leg? Okay. She took a step forward with a bent knee, and he placed his large hand on her thigh. Man, he sighed. She let him slide his hand around to her hip. Good, she asked. She flexed for him. Damn. After a second, she hipped away. Skinner stared after her. I go to work now. <coughs> you have to go? Yes, I go. He grabbed his camouflage off the stairs and hurried after her. She led them back through the derelict hallway and pushed out through the fire door. Hey, wait, Zole slowed for him. I want to ask you something, Skinner said. Thank you. intimidating it's not not really conversation uh, <laughs> inducing um, so those were both great thank you both very much but this question is for Atticus so I'm in the smack in the middle of your book and it's fantastic and I'm loving it and it's so hard to read I'm at the point I like I have to put it down and then because it's like oh um, 
but anyway, but it's great. Um, but so my question is, um, there's a lot of conversation right now about the supposedly uh, what's co been called the memoir novel, you know, where like you'd be writing a novel and it would be the char main character would be called Atticus. So your novel in some ways seemed so old fashioned in that it's not that. Of course, it's not old fashioned at all. It's very new fashioned. Um, but I just wonder if you could speak to that choice, um, you know, your process, what you wrote before and how you came to this way of showing this world um, where the main character is not called Atticus. Um, so thanks. Well, I, I appreciate, appreciate your question very much because I actually did set out to write a, an old fashioned novel. Um, I hadn't written anything before, and, um, what I, but I wanted to write something that I would like. And the types of books that I like are what you're calling an old fashioned traditional story, just something that's fun to read where you get lost in the story. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be about the guy writing it. Or, so that's really what I set out to do. Thank you. <laughs> it's not really old fashioned. It's, 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 it, it's, well, it's, um, it's a traditional approach to storytelling, I think is what you're saying. Right. But um, I think, uh, you know, the other type can work, the more uh, postmodern or modern, I'm not really sure what the words are there, but the, the approach that a lot of writers use, and um, I sense maybe you yourself are using, where the, it feels a little more potentially biographical, like where you mix a little bit more of the author self in. It just depends how you do it. I mean, anything can be terrific, depending on how you do it. And uh, I think that's a case in point today, sir. Right, from, right. From you. Well, and there, there's a notion, too, that almost, you know, realism of any type is starting to feel, I think, old-fashioned or has the potential to in the field of fiction. You know, uh, I mean, certainly um, including including characters that, that have the same name, uh, at, at the very least, as the, as, as the writers, so Charles Baxter doing that, or Percival Everett, uh, we're both fantastic writers. That I think that sort of postmodern or post postmodern, um, with the latter being the notion of sort of everything is permitted because everything has been exhausted, um, it has the potential to sort of discount um, old-fashioned or, or realistic storytelling. And and Atticus's novel is pr is clear proof that that mode of narrative is is far from deceased. So, yeah. You know, I can add one quick thing. It's that um, it's it's also based on the types of paintings I like. I, I like realistic paintings too, where you can really see, right. you know, right. you know, like Caravaggio, like that. Well, you can. I mean, you can see if you if if any if you've been in one of those food courts in Queens. I mean, you can see it. You know, it's like yeah. unbelievable. It's the, and the, and the other thing is just sorry. I'm now it's like a Valentine to you. Sorry. So don't get a big head. But the, the but the the dialogue it makes me think of Grace Paley. Who Grace Paley would get the way people, especially New Yorkers, talk in this right. amazing way. And and you get the way people talk. And it's, in some ways, I kept thinking this could be construed in some way as, you know, offensive, like the way, you know, the, the, the Chinese English. But it's not. It totally works. It's not offensive <coughs> at all. But that's like dangerous ground, right? So that must have been hard to do, I would imagine. I, 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 I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. <laughs> Your head's getting really big. No, no, what, I'm, what I meant was I understand the point you're making about potentially being offensive. Like if somebody says something that sounds like it's in dialect and you, uh, and, and you write that, uh, I understand how it could be offensive. Um, but it wasn't at all. I think if your heart's in the right place, if you're not lampooning somebody, then maybe that comes across, we hope. I, I spent um, about two hours this morning reading about five chapters of Henry James' Portrait of a Lady. So this is kind of a, uh, an abrupt change of gears. <laughs> and um, um, I could tell in reading Portrait of a Lady of who that Henry James was envisioning as his audience. And I wonder of whether that both of you had uh, an audience in mind when uh, when you were writing your fiction, yeah. I, what you think? Use the microphone. Um, uh, that's a great question, and um, I, I don't I don't know that I have um, anyone or any sort of group really specifically in mind when I'm when I'm writing. Uh, I think it's 
it's it's not how I, I sort of think about it, perhaps to my detriment. Um, but but uh, I, I'm sort of concentrating on craft enough where I I don't think that I'm really considering uh, an audience except s so broadly. You know, I mean, you, you want you want the story to be accessible. Mm -hmm. And and you want um, you want it to try to count, I think, to anyone or everyone. But at the same time, um, I, I don't think that I have anyone really specifically in, in mind. So I don't. I think that's the best answer I can give. Um, I'm a bit the same. I didn't have really. I just tried to write a book that I would enjoy to read and that my wife would enjoy to read the two of us, me and Beth. That was the, and she was the only person who really read it while I was writing it. So I probably had her in mind more than anyone. I, I just asked one more question of Charles and that is about, I, I read Atticus's book, but Charles, I have not read your stories. And one of the things that I was struck by in Atticus's book, Preparation for the Next Life, was how deeply that I could care for what was essentially a good man, but a good man who did bad things. Um, and um, so that was, uh, it was uh, instructional to me of how deeply I could care for a, a, a good man who did bad things. And I wonder of whether that there are the same kind of characters in your stories. Are the, are the people who are doing the bad things, are they good, basically good people? <laughs> right, right. Um. Uh, certainly, I mean, I, th I think that I see them as as good people who are who have really sort of lost themselves to actions, addictions, um, and 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 not locating for themselves a place in society. And whether or not you can really blame the individual for that or blame society for that, I think is perhaps a part of both our books. Um, I mean, the way that. Uh, the, that Atticus is able to render Skinner in, in a manner where sort of, especially as the book goes on, you, you see that uh, he, he's no longer, uh, to speak for you a little bit, I mean, I'm sorry if I do, like, uh, I, but PTSD and what it's doing to Skinner over the course of a book is so expertly handled. I, I, I have never read anything that comes anywhere close to, to Atticus's novel in regard to being able to um, effectively and clearly examine the effects of PTSD on a, on, on, on a soldier that's returned from war uh, in, in anything, nonfiction or fiction. Um, and, and so uh, at some point, I think um, my, my characters, and I think you're often seeing them sort of after that point, they've simply ceded to either their vices or other inabilities in regard to effectively navigating society. And so the story that I read, I think you're kind of seeing it post fallout. Um, and in Atticus's novel, I think you're seeing much more of a process and it is an amazing process to read and, and be a part of. Um, I'd like to ask Charles a question about the short story and um, I, I, I understand you've written a novel, but uh, also two books of short stories. And I was wondering, and particularly since it's come up of, of more traditional fiction and less traditional fiction than yours, um, I thought it was a beautiful, wonderful story of uh, putting together images and juxtaposition to, to bring us, the reader, to one point, uh, which is what I think short stories do so beautifully. And I wondered if you could just tell us why you write short stories and where you think they're evolving? Um, right. Uh, I, I, I don't think that, uh, I mean, I suppose I'll answer it. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I, I don't, I, I suppose that um, where they're evolving, I mean, they're, it's, it's interesting to me that um, as the short story, which perhaps has never been as much of a commodity as the novel in regard to selling books, I feel like with the amount of small presses and the amount of lit mags in in 2015 America, the short story in one way is having this real golden age while it becomes sort of less marketable to um, major presses. And so I think you're seeing a real spectrum of, um, uh, of sort of 
you know, traditional storytelling at the same time as, as really experimental storytelling in the short form. Um, uh, so, and, and at the same time, it sort of seems like it's short story collections are almost an afterthought for major authors. Like the novel has to come out first. That was certainly true with my, my first two books. Um, got, I, I got you know, a two book deal. I had the short story collection done, but Random House UK, which v the first two books are on outside of the country, wanted the novel completed uh, and put out prior to the short story collection. So obviously they see that as the avenue and, and progression, right? Um, uh, so maybe you have more freedom in the short form than you do in the long form, especially if you're looking to really make, um, really have your, your text be, your, your novel or sh uh, your novel be read by a lot of people, perhaps. Is that sort of, yeah, okay. Um, my question is for either of you, um, and it, hopefully it applies to both. Uh, both the story that Charles read and the passage that Atticus read um, both deal with very politically charged ideas and issues. And I'm wondering what either or both of you feel fiction offers that maybe other forms of media don't to deal with issues like that or to talk about them. I'm sure you didn't sit down and say, I'm going to write about gentrification or I'm going to write about immigration, but it comes out. And I'm wondering, how is that different? What does it offer that a newspaper article doesn't or a TV show doesn't? That's, that's a terrific question. I, um, I'm going to answer it in reverse. I actually started off thinking about an idea. Oh, that's I, great. <laughs> I, yeah, I started off thinking about an idea, um, which was I, 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 people have been saying that um, China is an example of a authoritarian but capitalist country, and that's supposed to be something unusual. Uh, I think that um, I, I don't know much about economics, but I, I think people believe that if you have a free market, that then political freedom has to come with that. And so China seems like a counterexample of that. At the same time, I think that this country, which is obviously a capitalist country, um, has uh, authoritarian trends. And so I began to think that there was a, a little bit of a parallel between China and the United States. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more parallels I saw. You know, I mean, I thought, well, the far west of China is a little bit like the far west of the United States. Um, anyway, I stopped thinking because I thought my job is to stay away from ideas and just worry about the story. And I, I, had, I came to the conclusion, if I just tell the story and maybe somebody reads the ideas into it, that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's up to them. But I just got to make sure I tell a good story. So I, I actually blocked those things out. Mm -hmm. I don't uh, make your response? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 that's said remarkably well. And, and I think it's the same sort of thing for me. I think it does get to a point where the sociology or the idea, um, those things are important, but there's a way for them to encroach upon character and plot. And, and they sort of, they're an avenue perhaps to thinking about action or characterization, but they ultimately have to be jettisoned at some point in order to concentrate on, um, on the story itself. Uh, but I mean, those issues are absolutely important to me, especially as, as Oakland um, enters its probably biggest gentrification phase of, of its life as a city. Um, so those ideas are there and they circulate, but um, uh, eventually it kind of, it, 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 they have to be set aside in order to concentrate on craft, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this is to Atticus. Your book is fantastic. And what I wanted to say was that when I read it, I wanted to tell everybody about it, which I did. But I didn't want to give it to anybody because I didn't know if I could put them through it. 
<laughs> so, so the person I gave it to was my granddaughter. She's about 23, and I thought she can handle it, you know, <laughs> toughen her up. But anyway, thank you so much, both of you.